What is energy density and what does it mean for you in choosing foods to help you with healthy weight loss and improve satiety? I'm Dr. Brett Schur, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and energy density is one of those terms that kind of maybe gets used a lot, but maybe people don't really quite understand it. So I'm going to talk about what it is and how you can determine if eating more energy dense foods or less energy dense foods is going to help you along your health progression. So first, energy density and nutrient density kind of get confused sometimes. I know I used to confuse them, but here's the thing. Nutrient density is a good thing, right? You want more nutrient density because you want as many nutrients as you can from the volume of food you're eating or the weight of food that you're eating. Energy density is a little bit different. We tend to speak about wanting lower energy density because what that means is you can eat a lot of food without a lot of calories, right? Energy is the word is the same as calories, but we tend to not like to use calories because it turns people off. But we have to be honest, calories matter. Energy matters. Even though you don't have to count them, you don't have to purposely restrict them, they still play a role in in healthy weight loss and health in general. So having lower energy density means having fewer calories per a given weight of food. So shouldn't be a surprise that low energy dense foods tend to have a lot of water in them, tend to have a lot of fiber in them, and also tend to be lower in fat, right? Because water and fiber take up space basically without providing any calories. And fat provides more calories per gram at nine calories per gram than does protein or carbs. So those are characteristics of low energy density foods. And we have a guide at dietdoctor.com that lists a lot of the specific examples. Leafy green vegetables, such as spinach, chard, lettuce, and kale. Fibrous vegetables, such as zucchini, asparagus, cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli. Some fruits and berries, even egg whites, soy, and other legumes, such as beans, and um, peas, and lentils. Low-fat dairy, Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, lean meat, fish, seafood, chicken, right? Those are all great examples of relatively low energy density foods, as opposed to the high energy density foods, like ultra-processed foods, such as fries, chips, and cookies. Oils, including coconut, safflower, and olive oil. Most nuts, oh boy, can you just go to town on nuts and get a lot of calories per per gram of food. Um, Butter, processed meats, and high-fat cheeses. So those are all examples of of higher energy dense foods. Now, when we talk about satiety and energy density, a lot of people could say, I eat some of those those high energy dense foods and I feel pretty full. And that can be true because there's a lot of calories with it, right? But when we talk about satiety per calorie, that's when a lower energy density foods come into play. Now, when we talk about satiety, and I hope I'm not getting too into into the definitions, we're going to get to some practical take-homes at the end. But when we talk about satiety, the way we at Diet Doctor use it, we're talking about short-term satiation. So how you feel at that meal. Okay, I'm, I'm comfortably full. I don't need to eat anymore at this meal. We also talk about the time between meals when you're hungry for your next meal. And then we talk about sort of the longer term overall reduction in calories and overall uh, decrease in hunger. So energy density by itself can help with short-term satiation. Some trials show over the long-term decreased calorie intake, but I think it needs to be combined with the other aspects of satiety, the higher protein percentage, at least in that 25% range or the 1.6 grams per kilo amount of protein, at least that much to really help with the longer term satiety and nutrient density, and also avoiding the hedonic characteristics, right? The combined carbs, fat, sugar, salt, ultra processed, all that together that just makes you want more and more and more. So the good news is those hedonic foods tend to be higher energy density foods. So if you're focusing on low energy density, you're kind of already getting rid of those hedonic foods. But it does also mean adding in um, protein to make sure you have a good uh, a good structure or a good balance of short-term satiation and long-term satiety. Now, here's some of the pushback though. Well, what about a keto diet, right? Keto diet tends to be high in butter and cream um, and, and oils, although it doesn't have to be, right? That doesn't have to be part of a keto diet, but frequently it is. And I feel totally satiated on a keto diet eating these things. Well, interestingly, the studies on energy density haven't been done in keto diets. They've been done in a variety of different macronutrient compositions and you know slight changes, but not really on a ketogenic diet. So could a keto diet be sort of immune to this energy density phenomenon? It's possible. It's certainly possible because so many people do experience that. But at the same time, um, frequently on a keto diet, protein percentage does go up. 
um, and overall fat may not go up all that much, although it goes up some, but the type of fat changes instead of getting it from, you know, ice cream and cookies and pastries and whatnot, you're getting it from meat and oils and, and cheeses. So the fat may go up, but all, maybe not as much as we thought. Now, the other part though is if you are succeeding on a keto diet and hitting all your weight loss markers and your, and your health markers, and you don't need to change anything, but if you're not, then one thing to look at could be the energy density. If you're having too much oils, too much butter, um, too much cream, too many of these energy dense foods, then if you could lower that, you might see more success on a keto diet and it's perfectly compatible, compatible with a keto diet. So what does this mean for you? Well, first, if you want to know the science about this and the studies, please go to dietdoctor.com um, for our dedicated guide about the science of energy density, and we'll link to that down below. But you should start thinking about this. How many calories per gram of food um, does this have? Or if you don't even want to think about that, just look at our list. Look at our list, which makes it really simple. And picking from the low energy density foods and picking from the higher protein foods is a great combination and a really simple way to get started. You can start with our um, higher satiety meal plans, which already does that for you, or just look at the food lists um, and, and do it on your own. But the key is to do that combination for better short-term satiation, long-term satiety, uh, to really help you on the path of your healthy weight loss. And it is compatible with just about any dietary intervention, including a keto diet, including a plant-based diet. Um, as long as you prioritize these factors, chances are you're going to do well with, with um, putting hunger at bay, not having the cravings, and being able to lower your calorie intake without even thinking about it. And that's the whole point about eating better, not necessarily eating less, eating better. You get all the nutrition, all the protein, all the energy you need with fewer calories without even thinking about it. That seems like a win-win. All right, hope this was helpful. If it was, please click the thumbs up and subscribe. And like I said, please check out the guide that we'll link to down below. And we'll see you here next time on Diet Doctor News on YouTube. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.